Hey, hey, welcome to Real Talk with Mr. Richard, a video podcast sponsored by 360 Dance Festival. Good morning, listeners. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button where you listen to your podcast. We are on iTunes, Spotify, and SoundCloud. If you prefer, we also have the video of these podcasts on YouTube. Check out the channel at Mr. Richard Approved. Now on with the show. All right, welcome listeners. We are here today with Miss Misty Lown, and I am so grateful that she's taken the time to talk to us today. And um, she is a wife, a mother, a daughter, a sister, a business owner. I'm going to stretch it and say a serial entrepreneur. You're real good at, at, at getting the businesses up and, and going. A coach, keynote speaker, and just all around great person. Welcome to Real Talk with Mr. Richard. Mr. Richard, I am so glad to be here. And one of the fun things about doing this with an old friend is you say my name right. Every place <laughs> else I go, I get some version that's not Misty Lown. You know, it's Lown, Lowen. And um, so it's just fun to be here with somebody that I know knows me well. And I'm excited to share a bit of our relationship with your audience. Well, fantastic. Thank you so much. So let's, um, uh, before we, uh, before we uh, dive into, the, uh, you know, the meat of, of the conversation, um, there is, uh, I forgot to mention that you are an author as well, um, on top of everything that, uh, that Misty does. Uh, she is an author, and I would like to, um, uh, there's a lot of your story in the book, and I would like to uh, have a separate uh, separate interview just for the promotion of the book so that we can get um, get this into more people's hands. But um, uh, with the exception of, uh, of uh, the story, the stories that are in the book, let's give uh, the, the, the listeners just a little bit of your backstory on how you got from, from young Misty to leader Misty. Oh. How did that, that, that jerk, that's a, that's a, a three part, four part series, I know, but uh, <laughs> let's give them just a little bit of a backstory. Well, first of all, I don't want people to be too impressed by the fact that I have a book. The reality is I had to sign up for a 12 step program to write a book because I tried and tried to do it on my own. I actually got 12,000 words deep into a book that the publisher was like, that's not the right book. So finally I got myself into a program that was accountable and I had to show up every week with my words written. And gosh, that just reminds me of growing up as a dancer, right? I mean, nobody or very few people end up in a recital without taking class or without a mentor or a coach or a teacher. And I love what you're doing here, Richard, being that person person for other people. And um, it, it just is so much of my life. So growing up as a dancer, I, as, as you know, I thought I wanted to be an Alvin Ailey dancer. I still actually would love to be an <laughs> Alvin Ailey dancer. I probably have not put in the time to qualify to be in that group. But when I was a young adult, I had auditioned to be a part of their training program. I was offered a spot in that. And it's just one of the few times I remember, I was actually watching the Ailey Company perform in our capital city of Madison, Wisconsin. And I just felt, you know, one of those little nudges in my heart, I would call it a, a God moment where I, I felt like my spirit was questioning me, what about this performance will you remember next week, next month, next year? And what are the kids that you're teaching back home going to remember of you for a lifetime? And, and for me, it, you know, it just went like this. <sighs> You know, that these kids were going to remember you know, my words, our relationship, those class times, the real talk, if you will, to borrow your phrase, Mr. Richard, they would remember that. And I knew that because I was already being invited to their graduation parties. They were already calling, uh, you know, calling me from, you know, outside of the dance environment, looking for advice and help. So I knew that my impact would be greater there. And so I could have put those aspirations of being on a stage on a shelf and I let the classroom be my stage. And ever since that time, I've been focusing to be the absolute best educator I can be. I, I finished a master's degree in education. We developed a teacher training program. As you know, I developed a company called More Than Just Great Dancing to basically be a business school for studio owners, most of whom came through an artistic background and ended up with a uh, broader job. You know, it needed more skills. And now we have Youth Protection Advocates in Dance, which is a 
a dance teacher, a studio owner training program. It's, it's education. So I really have let the classroom be my stage for my entire career. With a few performances in there, I did get to do some performing <laughs> professionally uh, with Dance Revolution. But I've never regretted, you know, listening to that little nudge, that still small voice that said, over here. And I just want to encourage your listeners that sometimes, you know, what you feel called to might look a little different than maybe what people would expect. You know, I think everybody here in town thought, oh my gosh, you know, you got the ticket to New York when I was 19, 20 years old. And when I said, no, I think I'm going to stay here and open a dance studio. I mean, I had people who said pretty blunt things like, I thought you'd do something more with your life. I mean, that was a direct phrase that was said to me. Of course, they don't say it now. Right. <laughs> right. After they after they would see what they did, but just want to encourage your listeners. It's not that classroom is better than performing, or performing is better than classroom, but one of them is better for each one of you. Great. great and great, for great. each season of your life. So that's how I landed where where I'm at. The classroom is still my stage. So uh, the seasons of your life that um, I think that that is uh, that that would be a, gr a, a, a nice umbrella to uh, to uh, keep everything uh, within the conversation um, cohesive. So um, the season let's so, so uh, let's start with that initial season of 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 starting the studio and that jump from the first studio to the second studio. How did the season change from that original studio that you had into that next, um, not only growth in the, in the studio, but how did you as a, uh, as a business owner take a, a step? How did you know to take a step and, and what were those indicators um, that, that uh, we could look for? Richard, that's a great question because again, I think especially if you're growing up in dance, you want the sequence, you want the choreography <laughs> to know how to build on things, right? You know, start right. in first position, you end up in fifth, you start at the bar, you go across the floor. So I think our brains are wired for what comes first and how do I, you know, build skill, build strength and being a leader. And I should say this too, you don't have to be a business owner to be a leader, right? You're a leader wherever you are. You know, you might just be in a class and you can be a leader. You might be a teacher, you could be a leader. You might be a program director, uh, company director, your know, actual studio owner. So, so leadership is really wherever you are and there's steps you can do to build that. So having said that, I'm going to speak very specifically now to my path as a business owner. So I have a mentor who explained the life cycle of business once to me this way, and it's, it just really resonates with me. So I'll share it here. He said the life cycle of business is not that much different than raising a child, right? So at first, you know, you dream of having a child and, you know, how great it's going to be. And then you actually have the child and you're, you know, maybe traumatized, <laughs> like, oh my gosh, it's up all night. It needs to be continually fed. It's never happy. You know, I had this life. I thought I was busy before. What was I thinking? And now, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a joyful, wonderful, trying, traumatic, amazing transition to go from, you know, dreaming about something to birthing something. And you know that full well. I mean, yeah. Richard, when, when I, it had the 360 festival and we transferred that leadership to you as the new owner, you were like, it's going to be so great. And it's probably <laughs> not, but a you know, a few days or hours later, you're like, Oh my gosh, it's going to be a lot of work. Right. <laughs> right. <But it's, laughs> every dream has that, you know, it, when it's birth, it has an infancy and infancy is hard. It's just hard in those first years of owning the business. I can't describe them any other way. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I went out to the studio at 7 a.m. I took my breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I did all of the work of running the business. And when four o'clock came, I swapped out my desk outfit for my dance outfit and I did a second shift. And after that, you know, we'd clean it, we'd put it back to order. I'd get home by 11 or midnight and we would start the next day over. It's just not too dissimilar to parenting, right? It's a, it's a baby and it needs all of that attention to thrive. You know, you can't stick a child in the corner and just hope it somehow grows. It has to be nurtured and a business has to be nurtured. A program, a relationship has to be nurtured. Well, you know, over time it gets some skills and it becomes a, a, a terrific toddler that has more skills than common sense, right? <laughs> all businesses and programs go through that. We're like, oh my gosh, it's great. Or people love us, or this is growing and it's blessed or whatever it is. And you can get yourself into trouble in that period, right? Where it's like, oh, we have a little bit of cash. Maybe you should save it. 
But what, what do we tend to do? Buy the new iPad, go to the new conference, or, right? And then the business grows up a little bit more and then you can leave it for a little while. Maybe, maybe at, your, at your conference, at your festival, maybe you'll be able to leave for two hours in the middle of the day. <laughs> you can't now. <laughs> no, not now. Not now. Not now, <laughs> but someday you will. You know, I don't have to show up every day. To, to my studio and eventually it becomes a teenager and it's more independent, but the goal, Richard, is to raise a functioning adult. So with your program, with your team, with your studio business, the goal is to raise a functioning adult, to be a guide from the side, not to be the sage on the stage, not to have it 100% dependent on the gospel of Richard. You know, well, if he didn't say this is how we're gonna do it, we can't make the call, we can't make the decision, the client's not gonna accept the answer unless Richard himself says it. You know, if, if, if anybody listening has a, a program, a business, or something they're responsible for that's more than 10 years old, and you're the only one who can keep it going, you don't have a business or a program, you have a baby still. So that's something I think about oh a lot goodness. in our coaching. I, just to repeat it one more time so that, that <laughs> we can hear that one again. That, that is, that is going to be worth the the investment of time listening to to the the audio for that phrase right there yeah if you you know if you are 5 10 15 20 years into your business and you can't leave it alone if you can't trust your team if it can't you know function without you you don't have a business you still have a baby you are still in that that nurture and when i explain it to people that way a lot of times they're like oh no wonder i'm so tired you know, no wonder this is exhausting. No wonder I'm not satisfied, um, you know, with my relationship to my business or my program or my leadership or my team because I have a 20-year-old expectation and it's behaving like a two-month-old. That is priceless. That is priceless. <laughs> that and, is you know, priceless. <laughs> you do have to hear, here's what I found. It takes a certain amount of... Um, just like in parenting, and you've watched me raise my kids. We have five. I mean, I met you and my second was just like a couple months old. Yeah, he was in the carrier. <laughs> yeah, it was like in the car seat. I'm taking class in the back of your class with one of my students. I've got Mason in a car seat and I'm like going across the floor doing my jazz and running back to make sure he's okay, pacifiers in, do another run across the floor. But it, you just have to, you have to realize that as a parent, it's actually right and good when they don't need you anymore. Yeah. And it's really hard. Like it's hard for my mama heart as a parent when my, you know, I'm, it's this bittersweet of like, I'm proud that my kids can make for the most part, good solid decisions and they're learning and growing and learning from their mistakes. But it's beautiful that you raise something up that is independent and can flourish on its own and have its own identity and personality in businesses and programs are kind of like that. It's hard to let go of control of making every decision and answering every email and, you know, being the go-to because there's a certain, even though it's exhausting, there's a certain amount of pride and identity tied up into like, I've got the answer and I'm needed and I'm important. Yes. And I've gone through several seasons of letting go where my first response is like, well, I guess I'm not cool anymore. I guess I'm not needed or they'll like somebody else more. And, and then I have to remind myself, but this is what you work for. Like you didn't want, my business is 23 years old. I don't want a 23 year old baby. Nobody wants their 23 year old child laying in a crib in their house. No, <laughs> no, 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 not at all. Oh my goodness. That, that, that If we stopped right there, it's we, we would be great. Like if we, if we stopped right there. Well, that, that I, I tell you what, great. I keep thinking about that. And let me add this just as another layer of thought for, you know, for us to think about because, you know, we are, uh, you creatives, we're creatives, right? So we like to create new things. Every time you make something new, the new thing's a baby. So it's like having another child. <laughs> so you can't have, you know, we have five. At one time we had, oh my gosh, you remember it, eight, six, four, two, and newborn. So we couldn't have the same expectation of the newborn as we could of the eight-year-old. I mean, at eight, Isabella was doing her own laundry because I was like, kid, <laughs> I'm here, get a stool. We had the stacking washer and dryer. I'm like, get a stool. These are the Tide Pods. No, they're not candy. Don't eat them. They go in the wash, turn the dial, you know, stand on the stool, pull it all out. I had that expectation because she was eight. I couldn't have that expectation of the newborn. So now as a studio owner, you know, I've built programs over the years. You know, when we started, we had ballet tap jazz. Well, eventually we added lyrical, then modern, then contemporary, then a company, then a competitive team and a traveling team and a ballet program. Every time we add something on, it's like adding a newborn. 
And you have to be willing to say life's going to be complicated for a little bit of time because this, you know, in my case, the eight year old has all this capacity and wants to run and do these amazing things. And mom's has to slow down and feed the newborn. <laughs> that is the feeding, feeding the newborn can be time, love, money, leadership, you know, and now with, with me to kind of carry out this, this parenting analogy, if you will, you know, when we, when we acquired Youth Protection Advocates in Dance from its founder, Leslie Scott, amazing, amazing founder who did so much work to lay the groundwork for that evidence-based research and an amazing advisory panel, uh, volunteer-led. We acquired that I knew as a parent of my businesses, I couldn't actually leave my other operations and go put my full-time attention into nurturing that. So I had to hire somebody, a nanny, if you will, okay. right? Like, you know, Emily is our program director and I had to have faith that I chose the right person and we do our daily check-in. And obviously just in case somebody's gonna email and say, did Misty advocate you hire nannies for your further siblings and only check on them once a day? No, people get strange things in a podcast. No, I'm not advocating that. I'm just trying to draw a parallel that if your plate is really full and you're trying to launch something else, you might have to trust somebody to do more of that um, nurturing infancy work than maybe you did the first time on your first thing. Right. And right? that is, um, that, that, that's also the, the development, if I'm correct, that's the development as a leader as well. You want to sure. have, a, a, as a leader at this point in the game and have, having birthed so many children, so to speak, and they've grown into their different stages. At this point in the game, if you do bring on a baby or a new business, you, as a leader, you we would want to be able to put a leader in that position that will take, that, that will serve the, the, the role as the nanny, a great nanny that will allow it to grow into the next Care stage. for it as so, their own you know, have that sense of fidelity, care for it as their own. There's a great phrase. Um, I got to do some uh, one, I had to have some one-on-one -on -one time with John C. Maxwell, one of the greatest leadership authors of our time. Um, he was a, doing a keynote speech up in Canada. I was the warm-up speech. So in like the backup dancer for John <laughs> Maxwell, right? There were no jazz hands involved, but I got to speak first and then he got this award and got to give his keynote. Well, we had dinner that night at the I was at the head table, then he invited me to go to Guatemala with his team and my sister Alana and I went, really great. Of all those great things, here's the thing that stands above everything else. He said, leaders create leaders, nothing more, nothing less. So if you're as a leader of anything, I mean, you could be a dance teacher who is a leader of the junior company and it's 12, 12 year olds doing a jazz dance. But if you're not creating leaders in that group, you're not a leader. Just to you know, maybe you're a choreographer, maybe you're a teacher, but we want to be more than that. We want, we don't want to waste any of what we can do with this and not lead. We want to create other leaders. And that, um, I, 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 uh, I think that the, you know, that, that, well, dance is generally late to the party when it comes to advancements in many things, um, technology, um, technology being one of those, um, I, I, I just, uh, I feel like sometimes with our, our old, not old way of thinking, but this is how dance has always been taught. This is the way it's taught. There's teacher, there is dancer, you do what I say, you do it the way I say, and then class is over, you return next week and repeat. And with that format, um, I think that the same way that the different styles of, of ballet, like Vaganova works on a body type. So it, the Vaganova technique is taught a way because all of the body types that do it are a way. They, they're yeah. all shaped a way. And the, the dancers that excel in Vaganova can excel because of the way that they're, they're structured versus classical ballet or chiquetti that, 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 fits, um, that fits everyone else a little bit better. It, felt, it fits different body types a little bit better. So when we take a look at dance and see where dance is as far as development, as, uh, as, as far as where dance has developed and evolved over time compared to technology or medicine or sports, 
Where would you say we are in that uh, in that child growth as far as an industry? Are we we're we're definitely not in the infancy stage, but we're we're not quite old enough to be an adult yet. We 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 still have some stages as an industry that we need to get accomplished before we can you know, we're our own self-sustaining industry, the way a sports system is, or the way that medicine is, or the way that music is. Where would you say that our industry is right now? Yeah, so I think I'm gonna pause for a second and just kind of break down for the listeners, because you may have teachers and working artists and choreographers and business owners. So I would say as an art form, it's more like a family, right? We have, you know, we have the the, you know, if you want to say like the grandparents of the art form, you know, those original artists and, you know, they carry the tradition and they were there when, and they're kind of the torchbearers, right? And you have all the way down to like these brand new things, you know, being emerged. I was just on a call the other day. I'm like, I don't even know what that is. They said, oh, you know, this style. I'm like, I have, I'm Googling on the call. I'm like, I don't even know what that is because new things were a creative art form. New things are emerging all the time. So you know, I would say in terms of the development of the art form, we've got the whole family, right? We've got the, <laughs> we've got the new things coming out. We've got those torchbearer grandparents who kind of hold the history. We've got all the crazy cousins we haven't even met yet. It, it, it's, it's, all, it's a whole family. As an industry, a biz, the business of dance, I would say, you know, we're probably, um, we're catching up, but we're probably 10 to 15 years behind. Let me just say, for example, a a, uh, maybe gymnastics would be a suitable example, right? So there's a little bit more organization nationally. Uh, there's, there's more standards uh, across in terms of, you know, like what does level one mean? That's just a very simple example. What does it mean to be a level one gymnast? So it doesn't matter if you're dancing in Wisconsin, Florida, rural, metro, nobody's confused about what level one looks like right. to be a gymnast. So now you go out to dance and level one is basically according to wherever you dance and whoever your teacher is and whatever curriculum you were taught. So when you start to say, you know, as, as a whole, and, and then you start to even count in, you know, vendors and suppliers and, um, you know, competitions and tracking into careers, our creativity has been such an advantage. And we've got this amazing family of artists but we haven't kind of as an amazing family of artists gone to a family reunion yet and said, hey, what, what would be something in some, some things that we could agree on that would be kind of stakes we could put down and say, these things are non-negotiable. So let me share with you what I would consider a non-negotiable. I would consider you know, at this point, and I didn't always do this because no better do better, I would consider background checking teachers non-negotiable. Right. You know, when I grew up, I just hired my the kids who grew up through the program or friends that I knew or people I trusted like Mr. Richard. And now as I've grown, I'm like, hey, you know what? Actually, that's not the gold standard. That was a good standard. But I know better now. And now I just I, I hold myself to a higher standard. We background check everybody. Richard, you have been working for us for probably 15 years before I ever asked you for a background <laughs> check. And I said, hey, guess what? We're in a new world. We know better. We're going to do better. We're going to do that. And I consider that a non-negotiable. So I think it's this big family. We're in a season where it's time to have a conversation like you're facilitating here to say, hey, what can, what can we come together and say for us, for our family, these things are non-negotiable. I think safety training is not negotiable. You know, you should have someone in your building that's CPR trained. You should have someone in your building that knows how to do basic first aid. Yeah. Your teachers should have a basic understanding of injury prevention. You should have a exit plan in your building. There's just safety basics that everybody else who works with kids from schools to daycares to preschools to summer camps to gymnastics to youth sports they're accountable for some basics and then i think you can color the lines all around these basics any way that you want to we can have there's space for the full expression of the beautiful family of dance you know the you know the maybe the prim aunt, if you will, who, you know, just has it a certain way and the wild cousin who thinks it can be expressed in this certain way. I think there's room for that in a beautiful family, but we can't, um, I don't think there's a lot of room for gray on some of those very black and white issues around fidelity and taking care, uh, taking, taking care for the responsibility of taking care of kids. Right. Um, well, Teachers. And the, the 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 using the the family the the family reunion idea like the first thing that i that that came to mind was the family tree and i feel like the tree has not been 
trimmed or it, it hasn't been it hasn't been groomed it hasn't been um uh, uh, uh pruned it, it, these are all things that you know that happen to trees to make the the the, the base stronger it makes it, it because if there's something that happens to the roots of the tree the tree will eventually die so um i love that that, that idea of of the family reunion but and my brain i i I'm st- I, I keep taking notes even though i know i have the transcript for this i am a note taker <laughs> and i am i am scribbling my it notes closes the learning loop that you, you know when you're <laughs> seeing it that's why we're visual here you're going to put this out on youtube eventually we're seeing it we're listening to it we're writing notes about it you can actually read it later it, it closes it closes the learning loop. And again, I just want to thank you for doing this and opening up conversations that are are really important. I, I do think we're going to see exponential fast forward motion for dance over the next few years. I think especially because, and I don't want to time date this interview too much, but to be fair, we are recording in the middle of a pandemic. Right. <laughs> so if you listen to this a year later, it'll be interesting for you to say like, oh, well that, you know, that was from the time of pandemic. Has anything changed from what they're talking about? But I do think that this pandemic environment has amplified the best of people and exposed the worst of our systems. And that it is, that is so true. And there's so many people that have, uh, that have phrased that, have, have said that exact same phrase in a different way, but it has, uh, it, it is, it is the, you know, you you really know the strength of the rope when it's put under pressure. You know how strong that rope is, um, and when you know how strong the rope is, it's good and it's bad because you know there's only so much tension that it can it can bear before it starts to unravel, or you know that it's strong enough that it can handle a little bit more. And the as un you know, I I, I like to say I'm I, I'm a a master lemonade maker and if i'm a master lemonade maker then you 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 are the 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 lemonade corporate epitomos <laughs> because if i i know that i that if it, that I'm, it, I'm making the crystal light that actually has no lemon in it <laughs> like it's so bad we got so much bad lemons they're not even lemons anymore they're just telling us we have lemons and i'm making crystal light out of it <laughs> And I love, you know, it's telling, telling, the, you know, finding the, the, the humor in, and this is, we have to have a sense of humor about some things as we move, move Absolutely. forward. But the lemons, uh, like, I know what, what kind of lemonade and the versions of lemonade that I've had to make. I can, I, I, I can't imagine, um, but then I'm also excited to, to one day be in the position where I had to deal with the lemons that you had to deal with. And, uh, so as um, as the uh, the founder of More Than Just Great Dancing, let's uh, just speak just a little bit to listeners that may not know what More Than Just Great Dancing is, and then we'll go into that, that leadership of the organization. Yeah, you bet. So More Than Just Great Dancing is a licensed affiliation of studios. I started it eight years ago. We're just on the cusp of starting our ninth season. And here's where it came from. So I've had my studio for 23 years. So I was in about my 15th year of studio ownership. I was writing nationally, speaking nationally, and I started to notice a trend. I mean, people would stick around sometimes for hours after I would speak to ask questions. They would write, call, they wanted visits to my studio. And it dawned on me, like they really, two things dawned on me. They're seeing something in what we're doing that they're not finding someplace else. And two, they need more support than an article or a conference or, you know, listening, podcasting wasn't really such a big thing then, but they needed more than just a short term lift. And we've all been there. We've gone to the master class. We're like, this changed my life. Have you ever had anybody say that to you at the end of a master class, Richard? Like, your class changed my life. And you're like, and, and you're, you're complimented by it, right? But you say, like, I want to see your life change when you come back next year. You can actually do those turns. Absolutely. Next year, Absolutely. when you have the chorus three. Like, you know, so <laughs> you accept the compliment, but in your head, you're kind of like, mm, I may have changed your perspective. I may have, you know, changed your mood, but I probably didn't change your life over the course of, you know, even for me, my book, or like I said, an article, a podcast, this recording. So I knew the missing gap, going back to that dance teacher training analogy, is nobody takes a master class and becomes a dancer. They go back to class. They show up on a weekly basis and they hit the plies and they hit the fundamentals and they, um, you know, stretch their creativity with, you know, with hip hop and with jazz and, you know, they all have their forms and their techniques. Like they train. That's what I'm saying. They train. Business is no different. You train in 
accounting and budgeting and finance and you increase your vocabulary. Dance has vocabulary. Business has vocabulary. Dance has techniques and skills. Business has techniques and skills. So what I realized was when people were saying, you changed my life, I want more. They weren't saying they want at another hour of me on a stage. They were saying, I need class. Yeah. Like, I grew up training to be a dancer. I need to train to be a leader. I need to I need to build the muscles of leadership and of business ownership. So we started more than just great dancing to basically leverage the systems and the approach we had taken in our studio business, Misty's Dance Unlimited, and to create this training system and a, a really a library, if you will, of everything you would need to run your business your way, not necessarily my way, but with proven structures and principles, just like choreography, right? There's some proven techniques in every genre. You know, there's some proven techniques in hip hop from which you can make amazing creative choreography. Same thing for jazz, ballet, modern, any of those things, right? But it starts with a foundation. It starts with a vocabulary and some skills. So we provide vocabulary and skills for business. And then people can color within those lines how they want to. So we currently have 300 affiliated studio owners serving about 120,000 kids a week. We have locations in 38 states and Canada, Aruba, Abu Dhabi, uh, New Zealand, the UK, Australia. And it's just been amazing to see such a desire from owners to, as I said before, to build those skills. Dancers get it. Like they know what it takes to get a skill. You can't just buy a skill. Any dance teacher on earth would laugh at the idea. And you, we get this sometimes parents who will say like, well, how many private lessons do I have to buy to just get to the next level? I'm like, well, you can't, you can't just buy a 10 pack of private lessons. You actually have to develop the skill. You have to do the work. You can't buy a 10 pack of conferences or listen to 10 podcasts or read 10 articles and become that. It would add to your knowledge, but you actually have to exercise knowledge to get gains. And that is... What is that? So in our group, we hold people accountable. We show up for class every week, basically. And we work our business skills and our leadership skills and our financial literacy. And we do that so that we can, and I'll just be really candid here, so that we can make a good living and have a good life, a life balance, uh, life quality, and make a good impact on our community. That's, that's what we do that for. And in, in, in light of, well, I, I'm, I'm just drawing uh, comparisons because uh, the, yes, we are in a pandemic, but our solutions to surviving this pandemic are so simple. <laughs> Wear a mask, wash your hands, and physically distance yourself. That's the, the best, that is before any vaccination that comes out, those three things that cost little to no money are the best ways for us to survive and <clears throat> protect ourselves. When it comes down to, to having a functioning business that provides those, those, those uh, that good living, um, give back to your com community and value to what you do, uh, those are not complicated. And uh, I, I, I feel like sometimes our industry, because you know, we love that to be advanced. We, we love to be advanced, like that, that, totally. that advanced or that pre-professional level. Like we are, we are determined to get there and we, we like to live there. But at the essence of all of that advancement is this basic understanding of the fundamental, of the basic yeah. understanding of business. It's the basic understanding of your own responsibility to yourself and to your community. So there's so many parallels that are within what you just said that uh, I, I feel that a lot of the listeners are can, will be able to not only relate, but they may not have seen it that way. Um, a lot of let people me make are... it really simple for everybody. We really start here with our with our any program that we put out through more than just great dancing. Business is math plus people. You know how I, I like to make things very simple. Like John Maxwell said, leaders create leaders. Nothing more, nothing less. If you don't have anybody, you know, if you don't have any following, if nobody's following you, you're not a leader. And if you're not creating more leaders, you're not a leader. Right? I mean, look behind you. Is anybody following? Well, you're probably not a leader. Right? Like, look at your legacy. If nobody else became a leader because you taught them, you're probably not a leader. Like, if 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 nobody ever learned to dance and you're a dance teacher, you're probably not a dance teacher. There you go. Very, very simple. And then in the business side, business is really just math plus people, and you have to get both of them right. And we've all seen many, many cases, especially in this pandemic environment, where people, uh, organizations, let me say it that way, organizations had 
the people, right? Great people doing great work, but they didn't have the math right. And we have seen legacy institutions wrap up in short time in this pandemic, like shockingly short time. And you realize that they didn't have the structure underneath them. They didn't have the bench strength. They didn't have, they didn't have the resources. So you have to get both right. And, and honestly, Richard, you have seen it in good times, the other way where people really crush the math, but they also crush people. And the math can never be more important than the people. So you constantly have to say, you know, am I being a good steward of the math, the business side, the numbers, the, the, the cost, the revenue, the cash management, the, the math. Am I make, being a good steward of the math so that I can take care of people? Am I hiring good people who will produce a good product that allows me to have the opportunity to be a good steward of the math? They're, they're not, I, you can't pull them apart. I mean, even for those of you who are listening and, and may have a faith background, you know, you can't even have a church without money. <laughs> Right. Even the great, you know, for, for me, I'm a faith-based person. I consider, you know, letting, showing people God's love, the greatest mission of my life. Right. And you, you, it's still difficult to do that with, and not that you can't love people without money, but it's really hard to have a church building without money. <laughs> right. It's really hard to offer programming. It's really hard to, um, you know, print workbooks or offer classes or support groups. I mean, it's hard to do that without resources. No different than dance. It's really hard to advance the mission without resources. Right. So you have to get both of those pieces right. And, and you, can, you can parse that out in infinite ways, right? The math piece can be parsed out into accounting, into budgeting, into tuition, into forecasting, into cash management. The people piece can be parsed down into programming and to HR and providing good pay and good benefits. And that's something I'm proud of over the years. I mean, we have raised our average teacher pay over the course of owning our business. We just did analysis of this. Um, it's doubled since we started. Like we have been able to double what we do for people since we've started. You know, that's two decades worth. But you know, our payroll has reflected not just our growth of serving kids, but our growth of growing people. Yeah, we now have full-time job opportunities. You know, we have paid time off. We contribute to retirement plans uh, because I want artists to know that they have value. Yeah. Their work has value. Like we take this seriously. That's why I take the math part so seriously because I take the people part seriously. It's, it's not binary. It's, and I think that's a false narrative in our dance community that, oh, if you love the art, you know, the money part is, is evil or something like that, right? right. Or, you know, or if, you, if you're serious about the financial piece, you don't care about the art. I consider it that I can't actually do, do my job on either side if I don't care strongly about each because they're, they're hard to separate. Right. And I... I, I... I am on board with making sure, you know, and I think that my, my mission and it may, that my mission may outlive me, which is going to be amazing. That, that would be a fantastic legacy for me to, to leave in the industry. But I, I want to work very hard along with, uh, with others to make sure that our art has its rightful place in the workforce. Like the, with what you, you're doing, it, more than just great dancing and with Misty Zance Unlimited, that should be the standard for all of our studios. That should be a standard for all anyone that works in this industry that they can have full-time work potential doing the thing that they love to do. We just have to put more effort and energy in the right places. Mm -hmm. And which segues perfectly, perfectly, perfectly. This is like, I, I didn't, I it's didn't. It's just like I, one of our I, normal conversations. This is like it's you and I at dinner and we're like, oh my gosh, where'd four hours go? These people are turning the lights off because it just, it rolls. And that's, uh, you, that is the, I, I, I love that. I love that, that uh, the, the casualness, but also the seriousness without it being so uptight. Um, we are talking about some serious stuff, but it, uh, there has to be, a, 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 it has to be alive. What we're talking about is living and it's fluid and it, it, it doesn't need to uh, be suit and tied and at a board table. It, we, can, we can have a serious conversation and uh, still have humor and, and, and flexibility as we have that talk. But uh, that segues, uh, segues into the, my uh, final point that I wanted you to talk about today is the importance of 
personal development for studio owners and, uh, and uh, uh, professionals in dance, as well as professional development for professionals in dance. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I remember in the early days of owning a studio, and I, and I will kind of uh, put a little asterisk on what I'm about to share. This was before I understood about business development, that professional development. I was still thinking that my whole goal was to make great dancers. So I'll be very candid in my studio ownership journey. I started out because people said, hey, you're kind of silly that you had this ticket to go to New York and train at the A. Lee School and you turned it down to be a dance teacher. You know, that looked as a that looked like a less than option to some of the people um, who were giving me guidance at that time, because that was, you know, that was 20, almost 25 years ago. That was when people would say stuff like, well, if you can, you do it. And if you can't, you teach. I think that's a huge that phrase has done a huge disservice Agreed. to people. Some people are DNA wired. They were created to teach. And I just, I just don't buy into that narrative that if you're teaching, it's because you couldn't perform or that's, that's, that's less than. So, but that was the narrative at the time. So when I started my studio, I was all about being awesome in, not just in the classroom as a teacher, but creating awesome dancers, because I felt like that was the way I would prove that I hadn't just done something silly by giving up my chance to teach. I'm sorry, giving up, giving up my chance to go to New York in order to teach. So I was really into that. I was going to a lot of conventions, conferences. I was getting certificates in, you know, dance and training and, you know, working on my graduate degree. I remember going to a convention. It was up in Minneapolis and I go to the teacher room and, you know, I've got my leotard on and um, I can't remember how many kids we had at that time, but not, not too many traumatic. So I didn't feel too bad about getting in my leotard still <laughs> at that time. So I'm in my leotard and my ballet skirt and, and I noticed that there were some teachers on the edge and they were older than I were, but I don't want to make this a young, you know, an ageism thing, but they were older than I was and they were clearly tired and, you know, they weren't going to participate. They weren't going to take notes. And I remember at that time thinking, I hope that never happens to me. I hope I never stop learning. I hope I never stop trying. And I think that's easy for a young person to say, and like, who knows how their body felt or how their knees felt or what their life story was. But in my limited view at that time, I was like, man, I hope that never happens to me. And then I really got into, as I've already shared with you, understanding that my job was to create leaders, not just to create dancers. My job was actually to create great people, not just great dancers. I mean, that's how we got more than just great dancing is we believe great dance is the baseline. And you don't get you don't get a pass on doing a great job teaching dance just because you want to become a great leader. Like you have to do that first and you add the great business on top of that. You add the great leadership on top of that. You have to have a good product to start with, right? So as I moved more into the business side and the dance, the physicality of the dancing for me started to become less of my daily work and the, um, the, intellectual side, if you will, not to say that dancing is not intellectual, but like I spent more time on books and numbers and marketing and advertising and curriculum development than I did on plies and tendus and progressions across the floor, right? So as the physicality of the dancing for me receded and I really started to work on, on the business side, I came to understand that I needed the exact same things that brought me up to be a solid dancer. I needed a teacher, I needed a coach, I needed class. I needed a performance, if you will. I needed something to work towards, you know, and maybe that would be giving a presentation. Maybe it's your year end PL. Maybe it's saving money to put a down payment on a house or a building. So I needed my recital, right? So I just took that, what I had as that dance learning all the way along. And as I did less dancing, I took that same structure and I applied it to my professional learning. And I'm still learning. I'm still you know, going, going to school, if you will. You know, I, I have a note on here. This is funny. I'm going to see if I can grab it. Oh yeah. I have a note here from a little class I took in May about physics. Yeah. I'm never going to be a physicist. Let's be really, really clear about that. But I was fascinated. I was listening to a podcast and I took some notes. I'm like, oh, I want to look that up. I think that's interesting. I think when you stop learning, you stop growing. And if you're not green and growing, you're ripe and rotting. That is just what I've seen is what I've experienced in my own life. And Richard, if I can say one more thing, I want to be Absolutely. really clear when I hopefully um, share encouragement, I do not always get it right. Not by a long shot. I go through seasons just like everybody else. I go through seasons when I'm on fire 
and I go through seasons where I feel like um, I'm in the fire. <laughs> I go through seasons where I feel like I'm kind of burnt and crispy and I need to rest and repair. So it is not a straight, you know, this growth we're talking about here is not a straight line. So please, you know, give yourself grace if you're listening to this and say like, oh, yeah, well, that'd be great if I had an awesome team and a couple businesses and I weren't trying to survive a pandemic by myself, you know, as a solopreneur. If this is your season where you need to rest and repair, rest and repair, but don't waste the season and, you know, not use your rest and repair to maybe journal or dream or do some passive learning, you know, go take a walk to get some fresh air and throw a podcast on. Right. You know, just, just don't waste the seasons. We are all in seasons. We're all in different seasons at different times. We just don't want to waste any of the seasons. Agreed. Agreed. Um, and I think that that gives us a, a, a nice solid stopping point for the conversation. Uh, this, we've been here today with uh, Misty from More Than Just Great Dancing. And uh, real quick, um, you got an award from Forbes, uh, the Forbes, it's Forbes Magazine. You are now, uh, you're, uh, I can't remember what the title is that, that you've earned um, with Forbes Magazine. So, so I applied to be a part of something called the Business, uh, Business Council Program. And so there's a variety of entrepreneurs from a variety of different backgrounds and it, it's a paid program. So it's, a, it's actually a training program. I pay to be a part of this training program, but as part of it, I get to, if approved, publish my ideas and my works and how I view our industry and the advancement of the industry. I mean, just really no different than publishing my book, right? So I signed up for a mentorship program. And at the end, I had this result that continues to, you know, yield good things. And that's what I'm doing with this business council. So I applied, I was accepted. So I'm a Forbes business council person. I'm learning and growing and training and hopefully out of that producing things that will outlast the year that I spent in this program. Congratulations. Thank you so Thank much you. for being with us today. And uh, we will, uh, I will have all of the links posted in the description uh, for More Than Just Great Dancing as well as uh, Missy's Dance Unlimited so that our, our listeners will know how to get in touch with the organization. And uh, we look forward to having you on again so that we can talk about one small yes. Okay. Yay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone. Listeners, don't forget to hit that subscribe button where you listen to your podcast. You can find all the information in the description below for more than just great dancing affiliated studios and find out more information about Misty's studio, Misty's Dance Unlimited. Until next time, this has been Real Talk with Mr. Richard, sponsored by 360 Dance Festival. <laughs>